And in studio with us is Helen Harris. Good to see you, Helen. Good to be here. Thank you. And Pastor Red Hall from Mount Zion United Methodist Church. Pastor, good to see you again. Uh, like I said, we should stop meeting like this. And I said, no, we need to meet more. Yeah. Last time we had you on, pull the mic much closer to you, Pastor, by the way, so okay. we can hear your voice much better. Uh, we had you on, uh, what, about a month and a half ago for the crosswalk, if I That's recall. That's correct. Right. How did that go? Did you get a good turnout? We had a we had the largest turnout that we've ever had. That's awesome. For the uh, crosswalk. And I want to thank you for your participation in it. Oh, you're welcome. Yes. Yeah, Judy Boykin calls and says, we need to get Pastor Red Hall on for the crosswalk. And I said, yes. That's what I do every year when Judy Boykin calls about that. <laughs> Anything Judy asks me to do, I say yes. And the reason is this. I've known Judy for a long time, 25, almost 30 years. And she's always been very involved in the community. Uh, but she also makes a killer plate of brownies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if I say no, I'm afraid she cuts the brownie supply off. Listen up, publicists everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely works. It's a, it's a fact. Uh, and let's talk about Juneteenth, Helen. Yeah, give us a little history here. Well, with, with Juneteenth, Juneteenth, um, the whole meaning behind that is back in, of course, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed on January the 1st, 1863, that information of freedom did not get to Galveston, Texas. And so therefore, the people that were enslaved in Galveston, Texas, were not free or aware that they were freed until June the 19th, 1865. So you can only imagine it as being in jail and here you were free or free to go and nobody told you until two and a half years later. Imagine how upset that person would be. So, but you look at these people who were enslaved, and even in New Jersey, they kept people enslaved until December of 1865. I didn't even know New Jersey had slavery. Oh, yes. And even though the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, there were still people in the North that were enslaved. And with these people that were finally freed, uh, of course, they held a celebration. Mm -hmm. And the celebration that they held was about reading scriptures and singing spirituals. And I have to say, John, spirituals are also my favorite. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I John, love the John was asking <laughs> Helen off before we went on what some of her favorite songs were because John, of course, was in a choir himself for many yeah. years. Yeah, I, I, I love the spirituals. So the program that we're going to be uh, having on June the 22nd is going to be about the spirituals, but also scripture readings that uh, coincide with uh, most of those spirituals. And this will be at the Mount Zion United Methodist Church. Yes. June 22, 5 o'clock, yes. which is where Pastor Ed Hall comes in. Yes. Uh, yes. Pastor, tell us about uh, the 5 o'clock celebration. Well, again, when we look at uh, Juneteenth, we want to look at it in a way where or educate people on what it truly is. There are many people that don't even know what Juneteenth is. And, and so uh, we want to make them aware of it, but from a scripture standpoint, I want to bring it to your attention. Uh, when you look at uh, Exodus 6 verses 1 through 13 it speaks about Moses and I was trying to in my own mind trying to think what Abraham Lincoln was going through and what Moses was going through both were trying to free people okay Moses was called by God to help to free the Israelites. Now, Abraham Lincoln, I'm sure the, the, the country was divided and 
It was at war. Now, Abraham Lincoln still had that hope that he could bring people back together. And so I'm sure that he prayed that God would give him the wisdom to do this. And uh, I see the connection between Moses and Abraham Lincoln. Both, again, were called to free people. And this is what Juneteenth is all about. If you go back to Mount Zion, okay, Mount Zion was started by 18 former slaves, former enslaved people. And a lot of people don't know the story of Mount Zion, but Mount Zion... Could you tell it? Mount Zion actually was started by 18 free, formerly freed slaves, excuse me, formerly enslaved people, and they walked into Calvary Methodist Church here in Martinsburg, and in their mind, they were free people, and they would be treated fairly. And so now when they walk in, they walk in and they're showed the balcony, okay? And they, they're showed the balcony and it reminds them of a time when they were enslaved because the balcony symbolized where the slaves sat. The slave owner would bring his, his people and I'm talking about his plantation people and the slaves to church, but the slaves sat in the balcony. When they walked, when the former slaves walked in to Mount, uh, I mean, into Calvary, they thought, we're free, we can sit anywhere we want. But again, that was not the case. And so they stayed for the service, but they also uh, were able to start a church. And it was a little one-room church. Uh, and uh, that's how Mount Zion was started. 1866, now look at this, 1865. It was a year prior to it but it, it, it was the same thing mm -hmm. it was the same thing and it's fortuitous that you're here on this day because just about a hundred years later this day 1963 governor george wallace of alabama mm -hmm. stood in front of the foster auditorium at the university of alabama in an attempt to block two black students from attending the school Later that day, accompanied by federalized National Guard troops, they were able to register to attend. And on that exact same day, John F. Kennedy addressed Americans from the Oval Office proposing the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So this is, you go, you go 100 years before that, you're talking about Abraham Lincoln. You go 100 years later, we're still fighting the same battle in 1963. Yes. Well... We're still fighting that same battle right now. In 2024. It's 2024. Mm -hmm. We're still fighting the same battle. You look at these states who wants to do away with DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. You look at the books that were banned. You look how they don't want black history to be taught. And that's one of the main problems. That's why so many of us were not aware of Juneteenth because it's not in the history books. You know, we weren't taught anything about what happened 
back then. And now you want to do away with all that? You want to ban these books? And people, you know, you look at our young black children today, and not even just the young black children, but also the white children, are not going to learn the history. The history may be ugly, but it is the history of the United States. 250,000 people were enslaved in Texas after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. You know, how, that, that is really ugly history, but it's history that has to be told. And what right have this country have to ban that history and keep us from learning that history and to do away with DEI? So DEI is routinely a debate topic in our Facebook community during the course of mm -hmm. the show. And it seems to mean different things to different people. And a lot of that seems to be based on race or political party as mm -hmm. the divisions as to what you think DEI is and whether it's beneficial or not. What is DEI to you, Ellen? When I think about DEI, I, I, I think about where we are now. When people, uh, and most of them are political people, when they think that we are equal, they, they think that we're equal, so therefore you don't need to have to worry about diversity or inclusion or whatever. We are yet not equal. Why do you say that? Because, you know, okay, I, I, I just saw on the um, TV the other day, and I forget the actor's name, and he talked about going to get uh, an apartment for his son who was going to be entering college, okay? He filled out all the necessary papers. They know he's an actor, but yet they told him no. So he offered then for to pay the rent for the whole year, the term of the contract. They still would not rent him that apartment. Where was this? You know, I, I, I can't even tell you. I can't even tell you the name of the actor. I can picture him, but I can't even tell you his name. But when I heard that the other day, I was in the kitchen and I just stopped because thinking this is still going on, knowing that it's still going on. Gosh, it happened to me when I first came out of school one in an apartment. It happened to me twice. So when you look at um, being included in, in, in different things, you know, you're doing away with affirmative action because you don't think it's no longer necessary. But yes, it is. It is still necessary because of the fact that how blacks are looked at and they're not given the same opportunity is in some cases, you know, and, and I, I think about Shirley Chisholm said, and I quote this a lot, that in order to have a voice, you must have a seat at the table. But a lot of times they want to deny us that seat at the table. But she said, if they don't give you a chair, bring your own. Because you have to push your way through in order to have that voice at the table and in order to make people aware of the different things that are going on and in hope that they will listen and try to understand. So yes, I, I see that uh, when you look at, we are all diverse people. And when you look at equity, you know, you look at the difference between someone with the same degree and if you're white, what you're gonna make and if you're black, what you're gonna make. Mm -hmm. You know, so you look at equity and inclusion just as a whole. And it's something that I, I think that, um, you know, to try to do away with that is damaging to a people, but also to this country, whether they realize it or not. Billy. Yeah, I thought there were specific laws, specific federal laws that prevented discrimination for housing and certain other things as well. So the example you're given with this, this actor, that was in clear violation of federal mm -hmm. laws. So you cannot condemn, I don't think, society as a whole. You might should condemn an individual or you can condemn an, an, a community for not enforcing the laws, but the laws are in place. The laws are in place, but are, you know, like we said, the laws aren't being followed but the problem is you're having more and more and more of this. And we're, instead of going forth, we're, we're going backwards. In a lot of cases, we're going backwards. And, and Helen, I, I agree in part. I also, uh, now granted, you and I 
by the color bar scan, we've historically viewed things differently, even though I think both you and I try very hard to to look at the, the goodness in people mm-hmm. rather than anything else. Uh, but my sense is that, uh, that there have been a lot of advances. Uh, and I thought a generation before, a generation half before, uh, the the advances were more appreciated and more accepted than they are today. And I get the sense that there's a that people say we've had a lot, we want more, and we're going to be taking the same fairly aggressive position that Rosalie Parks and others took to great success. What I'm saying is, I think that uh, we are now a uh, our we're a polarized nation. And both sides are taking a more aggressive position, feeling that they are being discriminated more than what we were doing 15, 20 years or so ago. Well, I think what you take away, when you ban certain books and you want to do away with DEI, you want to do away with affirmative action, you're constantly talking about this woke society, you know, I see it as we're going backwards instead of trying to recognize and understand where people are coming from. And what it does, it constantly, in my opinion, make African American and oppress people. Well, this is, everybody walks in their own, in their own skin, right? In, in their own shoes. So it, it, I think it's really difficult for someone as, as white as I, and as privileged as I, uh, to judge anything of, of your experience. Um, however, it's really difficult to ignore the fact that uh, a black president was overwhelmingly elected with huge majorities of white voters, as well as black voters. That speaks of something uh, in terms of a balancing, in my, as, as I look at it, that sort of, a, a, that would not have happened in 1963. So that, that speaks of some change in, in mindset. And I hope that you find some element of optimism in, in that evidence. But I do want to talk a little bit, going back to actually the elements of, of June 19th, 1865. And when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, also going to the slaves that were freed late in New Jersey, he didn't free the slaves in New Jersey. He freed the slaves in the states in rebellion, mm-hmm. that's, that's the wording. Yeah. So he freed the slaves of the Confederate States of America, which was, they thought, that, that, was, that was the issue at hand. So he didn't, he freed states in a country over which he had no jurisdiction in the minds of Texans. So of course they weren't yet freed until after they lost the war and then they were freed. So it makes perfect sense, yes. you know, in, in, in the historic perspective. So I, I think when we get into high dudgeon about these things, about how outrageous it was that somebody was freed and then they were kept in jail for another two years, well, that was the issue in play. And it took a lot of blood. And there was a lot of people who died, a lot of, frankly, white people who died in, in defense of of defi- double negative here to to end slavery and and I think that's important to have to recognize in history as well so obviously Jim Crow was terrible uh, a lot of the reconstruction era was terrible what led up to the civil rights act was terrible but the civil rights act was 1964 and this is 2024 So in that, if I do the math in my head real quick, that's 70 years. 60. 60 years, thank you. (laughs) So in that 60 years, there has been a lot of progress that does include a black president, now a black vice president. Um, So when we we talk about the divisions, we talk about the anger, okay, we can can concentrate on the negatives, and I understand that that's very hurtful, and it's not a hurt that I will feel. However, I was bust during the busing crisis when I was in seventh and eighth grade. I was the one who went from the frankly very safe area where I was growing up and I was bust into the very 
unsafe area as a way to balance out the equation. Um, it was terrible. So my experience was, was pretty awful, right? So my immersion into that community was all violence that I had never experienced before. Did that change my viewpoint of things? Yeah, in the short term, probably. But I was 11 or 12 years old. So, you know, we, we move on. So we all carry, the, <clears throat> we all carry the, the experiences that we've earned over life. And the cool thing about getting to be a certain age and having this color hair for what's left of it is, you know, we got to balance it out. So, you know, I, I think that, that what I hope out of this and out of celebrations like Juneteenth, I, and I do think the, these are things that, that we need to concentrate on, but um, there's a lot of good with the anger. And there's a lot of, and, and there should be, there's a lot of anger to get through. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer to go with, with concentrate on the good and, and let's figure out a way to get rid of the rest of the bad. May I? Oh, sure. The, I belong to a committee and it's a group of pastors here in Berkeley County. It's called the Berkeley County Ministerial. And you spoke of division, okay? There are white and black pastors attending the meetings and the functions of that Berkeley County Minister. But we also have little events, and one of them is to meet on Zoom every Tuesday and to come together, communicate, on what is dividing us, okay? And I tell you this story because there's one white pastor in the whole group. The rest of them feel that they will lose their congregation if they if they speak against what the church stands for. And so you have five or six black pastors, one female white pastor. And I commend her because she puts aside all this and she's trying to communicate. Now, I'm going to give you an example. I see you're married. If your wife and yourself do not communicate, you will surely have division there, won't you? Because that communicating enlightens that relationship that you have with each other. Well, Just like praying to God. If you never pray to God, you can't have a relationship with him. It's what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years. The Berkeley County Ministerial Association had more whites 20 years or so ago than they did black members. Mm -hmm. What has happened in the last 10 to 12 years to give this, this radical change? I can't put my finger on it. Uh, we still, at, at the, the beginning of the month, we still have whites attending. But they will not attend the Zoom meeting where we, dis we, we pick a book and all of us agree on the book that we're going to discuss. You're talking about a book out of the Bible? No. A book, period. Just a book that has been written by different authors. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it pertains to race 
and we cannot get individuals to participate. Pastor Hall, Helen Harris, I am just about out of time here. In fact, we're a little bit over time here. Again, the Juneteenth celebration is June 22, 5 o'clock at the Mount Zion United Methodist Church at 522 West Martin. Uh, of just a minute here, what will you be doing at 5 o'clock, specifically to the activities? Well, basically, we're going to start with, uh, we're going to have a, um, information about uh, Juneteenth. Mm-hmm. And... Um, rest of the program is basically going to be on scripture and the singing of spirituals any refreshments oh yes at the end there will be refreshments that is really important feed the flock helen feed the flock <laughs> that'll, that'll keep that'll bring people oh yeah you will have refreshments i just won't tell you what they are but you will have refreshments all, right, very all good. are invited that's the main thing all are invited yes thank you so much for coming in today thank you it is uh, 9.35.